Hey, what's up guys? Uh, today I have a new installment on my Explain Like I'm 5 series in which I try to accomplish two things. Number one, uh, talk about a technology topic, software engineering and software development uh, in very simple terms so that even a five-year-old could understand them. And the second thing is trying to be as concise as possible. If I can make the video in five minutes, I'll take five minutes. If I can make it in 10, I'll just take 10. The topic for today is TLS. And basically you probably use this all the time when you're using HTTPS. But I'm trying to cover like how it works, like the concepts behind it so that you can understand what's underneath. I just got kicked out of my home office by my wife. So I'm recording this outside. Let's get into it. Okay, so you have host A and host B and they're connected to each other through a series of intermediate hosts that forward along the information. You wanna build a secure channel from A to B so that two things happen. Number one, even if anybody can read the message, only host B will understand, okay? So encryption basically. And number two is that nobody can impersonate host B. So let's focus on the first problem. Encryption. What I'm gonna cover first is asymmetric encryption and this is not a video about encryption so I'm gonna try to do it really quickly and broadly, okay? So imagine that you have two keys and whatever one key encrypts, the other key can decrypt. So what you wanna do is make one of those keys public and you give it to everybody else, okay? And you keep the other one private to yourself. So any, anybody that wants to talk to you, they can just use your public key to encrypt that information and because you are the only person that holds the other key because you kept, kept it private, you are the only one that can decrypt the information. Okay, let's talk about the next step. The next step is you could take that public key and say, hey, this public key belongs to google.com. So if you want to talk to google.com, you can encrypt it with this public key and google.com will be the only person that can read it because they are the only ones holding the private key. So when you take a public key and you give it an identity, in a nutshell, that's what a certificate is all about. The problem now is anybody can generate a key pair and say, hey, this public key belongs to google.com. And so they could impersonate Google. So you need a way to trust a certificate. All right, so here is where I'm gonna give you a real life example. Two and a half years ago, my wife and I found out that we were having a baby girl. A few months later, and just when I had thought that I had met the most beautiful woman in the universe, a miniature version of myself comes into the world. Now, it turns out that with this new family member, our house became too small, right? So we had to look for a bigger house. A friend of my family was uh, moving out and his house was going to be empty. So he was looking to become a landlord. He talks to us. We reach an agreement. So we become his tenants. Two weeks later, we're moving into the house and he says to me, look, I've had a housekeeper for about a decade now. She's very trustworthy, very reliable. You should hire her. So I said, sure, I'll hire her. One week later, I meet this complete stranger and she just walks into my house and she starts helping us out. Think about what happened there. A complete stranger now has access to enter my house. I trust her. Why? Because I I've never met her. I trust her because my landlord trusts her and I trust my landlord. Okay, so before we move into certificate world, let me expand my example a little bit. It turns out that I don't trust my landlord directly. Actually, he's a friend of my parents, right? So my dad, whom I trust, trusts the landlord and the landlord trusts the housekeeper. So there's the chain of trust that we establish. There's a point at which my example breaks down a little bit. See, for my example, what I am trusting is behavior, right? I'm trusting that the housekeeper will not steal from me. With certificates, what you're, what you're trusting is identity, that someone is who they claim to be. So now, imagine that I've never met the housekeeper. She comes to my house and she shows me a paper saying, hey, I am the housekeeper that they told you about signed by me, the housekeeper. That doesn't mean anything to me. I can't trust that. That's the equivalent of a self-signed certificate. What I would need if I've never met her is I need for her to show me a, cert a paper saying, hey, I'm the housekeeper that you, know, you heard so much about, signed by the landlord. And I am supposed to recognize the signature of the landlord. So then it has validity to me because she's holding that paper, which would be the certificate. Now we're ready to jump back to 
TLS. In certificate world, my dad, the person I trust beforehand and who doesn't appeal to anybody else, that would be what is known as a root certificate authority. For this to make sense, you need to understand that your browser and your operating system, they ship with a pre-installed list of certificates for the root certificate authorities that your operating system or your browser is going to trust blindly. Uh, if you don't have that, you, can, you can't trust anyone. In my example, if you take my dad out of the picture, everything falls apart because I can't trust the landlord and therefore I can't trust the housekeeper. The landlord is what would be known as an intermediate certificate authority. He is still an authority. He can still have me trust people, but only because he appeals to my dad, which is the root certificate authority. So you can have a chain from the root all the way to, a, to the entity that you want to verify of intermediate certificate authority. In, so, okay, so in my example, when I say you take a public key and you give it an identity and that's a certificate, what you need to understand is that the certificate needs to be issued, here's the key, by a trusted certificate authority. The idea is I can't issue myself a certificate. What I do is I generate the key pair right? The private key and the public key. And then I take that public key and I, and I go to a certificate authority and I tell them, hey, look, I have this public key. It belongs to Gabriel Zimmerman. I need you to issue me a certificate. So the certificate authority will say, okay, I see your public key. I see your details. I need to verify, right? That you are who you're claiming to be. So for instance, they'll ask you, if you're trying to verify a domain, they will ask you to create a DNS record with a specific key or put a file in your server so that they will try to retrieve it. And if they can, they know that you own that domain. They will try to establish that you are who you, who you claim. And then once they have verified your identity, they'll say, okay, here's a certificate signed by the certificate authority. Here's a very important thing. Now that you have a certificate, if you hand that to a person. They need to trust the certificate authority that issued that certificate. If they don't trust that, your certificate is worthless to them. Let me very quickly repeat my example. The housekeeper comes to my house and she, she has a paper saying, I'm the housekeeper signed by the landlord. Now, un unlike my example, she needs to show me actually the full chain that leads back to my dad. All right. So she needs to have a certificate that says, hey, I am the housekeeper signed by the landlord. Next, she's going to have to show me a certificate that says, this is the landlord signed by your dad, right? Okay, now we're good. Once I have that whole thing, I can trace all the way to my dad. And I know my dad's signature. And I can verify that my dad signed the landlord certificate. And that the landlord signed the housekeeper certificate. All right, so that's exactly what happens with the certificate. When you receive a certificate from Google.com, your browser will look at, okay, who issued this certificate? Who signed this certificate? Okay, it was signed by some intermediate CA. And then who signed the intermediate CA? It was signed by DigiCert. Okay, now I can trust it. All right, so to wrap up this part, this is why you can't just make a certificate, why you can't just take a public key and say, hey, this public key belongs to Google.com. Why? Because when you do that, when you create that certificate, it will have to be signed by somebody. And if you sign it, that's going to be worthless to whoever you send it to. It's going to be like, hey, Gabriel Zimmerman signed this certificate. I don't care. I don't trust Gabriel Zimmerman. No, no. You need it to be signed by a trusted certificate authority by the other party, right? So you, you can't do it. You need a certificate authority that they trust to say, yeah. This public key belongs to Google. And the certificate authority will not do that, right? Because they'll be like, okay, prove to us, before we give you the certificate, prove to us that you're Google.com. You won't be able to do that unless you've hacked Google. Now, there's one pending question that I want to answer. Maybe you're thinking, okay, I can download Google's certificate. And what if when somebody asks me for my identity, I just present Google's certificate? That's not going to help you, right? Because why? Because think about it. What the other person will do is they'll look at the certificate and they'll be like, okay, yeah, this certificate says that this public key belongs to Google and it's signed by a certificate authority. Okay, fine. So they're going to take the public key from the certificate and they're going to encrypt everything with that public key. 
and they're going to send you the information. But you don't have the private key for that. So you can't decrypt it. So now you're stuck with someone who thinks you're Google.com, fine, but they're sending you traffic encrypted with a public key for which you don't have the private key. So it's worthless to you to impersonate Google in that way. You need to have the private key. In the comments below, I'm going to post a link. If you're on a Mac, for instance, there's a link in Apple.com that says your computer trusts all these certificate authorities. And one more thing, if you're curious, is remember I told, when I told you my housekeeper comes to me and says, hey, I am the housekeeper and you can trust me, signed by the housekeeper, and how that was pointless to me, right? Well, root certificate authorities, when they give you a certificate, that's exactly what they do. They say, hey, I am, you know, Symantec or whatever root certificate authority signed by myself. All right. So there's a lot of articles about the handshake. So I'm not going to go into detail there. I'm going to put the links in the description below for articles and videos that I think are pretty good. So I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So instead of explaining the handshake in a very detailed manner, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain why and the purpose and a very rough overview of what it does. So in the beginning of the video, I talked to you about asymmetric encryption. You have two keys, you know, whatever one encrypts, the other one decrypts, that whole story, okay? It turns out that that's great when you want to talk to somebody you've never met because you just give them your public key. They can just start sending you encrypted data, but it's slower. Slower than what? Slower than symmetric encryption, okay? So symmetric encryption is there's one key, you know, and you use that key to encrypt everything on one end and to decrypt everything on the other end. That's symmetric encryption. Ideally, that's what you want to use. Okay, so the handshake in TLS is all about that. It's all about taking the best of both worlds. So what it's going to do is it's going to use asymmetric encryption in the beginning and it's going to switch to symmetric encryption so that by the end of the handshake, you should have symmetric encryption over your connection. So the first message is a client hello. The client is basically going to say, hey, Here's the TLS version I understand. Here's the cipher suites or the encryption mechanisms that I understand. And it's going to send some random bytes. The server is going to respond with a server hello, in which it's going to uh, send the certificate chain that I was telling you about. And it's going, to send, it's going to start a server key exchange. So like I said, I'm not going to go into detail here. But the point that you need to understand is that what the server is trying to do, what they both trying to do is they're trying to get to a point where they exchange some information so that they, on their ends, they can do calculations and ultimately arrive to a key that they can use, the same key, so that they can use that for symmetric encryption. So they're never going to send the, the key over the wire. Rather, what they're going to do is they're going to use asymmetric encryption to share details enough so that each of them on their side can derive the key. So that's what you see in the later stages of the handshake. What you see is the client is going to send some stuff and then it's going to say, hey, I want to change cipher spec, right? That basically means I want to switch to symmetric encryption already, okay? Enough of asymmetric encryption. And then the client is going to say, I'm finished. The server is going to reply, okay, I'm ready to change cipher spec and I'm finished. Now, by this point, what you have done, you have started with asymmetric encryption and then you did all that handshake and ended up with symmetric encryption, right? So you're taking, if you take anything from this part of the video, the point of the handshake in TLS is to leverage the advantages of asymmetric encryption so that a host and a client can talk to each other securely without ever having met. But because this is lower, asymmetric encryption is lower, they do the handshake so that they can switch to symmetric encryption. That's pretty cool, but as you notice, there's a lot of round trips here, okay? Now, encryption here happens after this TCP handshake, okay? So if you're on TCP, you first have since and ACK, ACK. You have a round trip there, and then you can do the TLS exchange, which is another round trip. So in version 1.3 of TLS, They've upgraded the protocol and they can now support the handshakes that I'm showing you now. 
okay, which is a much shorter handshake. Now, the way that they achieve this is by saying, when the client says hello to the server and it sends the Cypher suites that it supports, it's going to assume that the server is gonna pick one of them, right, the most likely to be picked, and it's already gonna generate some of, this, some of the information to derive the symmetric key be, without waiting for the server, okay? So if the server agrees with what the, with the client picked, because the server could say, no, I'm gonna go for something else. If the server agrees, you saved yourself a round trip, so it's a much faster thing, because something that was criticized from TLS was that because of the multiple round, round trips, you, it introduced latency. So if you're doing real time, uh, you have you know, the TCP latency, and on top of that, you have TLS, just, it's a slow start. Something else that TLS 1.3 introduced is a zero round trip resumption, which roughly means you know, if we have done this handshake before, we can just reuse some of the results from the handshake and just resume talking without having to do a handshake again. Now, again, I'm being very broad here, okay? So I'm not trying to be careful with my definitions. If you're paying a lot of attention, you could say, well, technically, that's not the point of the video, okay? All right, guys, so this is everything I have for you today. I hope it was useful to you. And if you liked it, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you can get more videos on this series. I'm gonna be covering OAuth. I'm gonna be covering Kubernetes, you know, uh, programming tips, all of that. So stay in touch and I'll see you guys in the next one.